We are set. Okay, thanks, Georgia. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Roy Letterman from uh, the Department of Statistics and Data Science and uh, a number of other institutes um, on, on his front page there um, uh, at Yale University. Um, so Roy, uh, take it away. Thank you, Will, and thank you very much for inviting me. I wish I could be there uh, in person. I thought when we were coordinating this, maybe I'd be able to hop on a plane, get there and get back, uh, but um, turns out it's a, not a very good day to, to be traveling. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the geometry of molecular conformations in cryolectin microscopy. And first I wanna show you this abstract for it. And and the reason of, the, the main reason I want to show you this abstract, so there's two reasons. One, it's it really is the most beautiful abstract I've ever seen for uh, a talk about conformational heterogeneity in cryo EM. Uh, the other reason that I want to show you this is because Chet GPT wrote it. Um, <laughs> So I was thinking if I if I should use it or not, but I chickened out and I didn't send you this abstract. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's a very impressive abstract. I'm not going to talk about exactly what this abstract is describing. Uh, I am going to uh, talk about kind of uh, the story of uh, continuous heterogeneity in cryo EM where the different approaches to it and where where things stand uh, stand now. Um, but in addition to the story, I, I, what I kind of want to tell you about is actually a lot of the lessons learned along the way about um, um, some things in manifold learning, some things in, uh, in uh, uh, deep learning, um, so I, I hope that it won't be a story that's only specific to cryo EM. Uh, I think there's a few takeaways about uh, some some thing, some of applying some of these tools to uh, problems in in physics or with kind of physical problems. So first of all, I should start with what is cryo EM. Uh, cryo EM, cryolectin microscopy. It's a technology for uh, figuring out the spatial structure of molecules. Uh, the way it's done is that you take these uh, usually biological molecules that you're interested in, uh, you um, put them on this uh, on this grid. You, sorry, you you dissolve them in water. You put them on this grid. Uh, you flash freeze this grid, and then you have this very thin layer of ice with the uh, with the molecules embedded in them. Um, then. Uh, I'm going to use these guys that I carry around uh, as sort of stand-in for, for a molecule, but we'll get to actual molecules. So you have these guys um, embedded in a very thin layer of ice. You put them in an electron microscope. You bombard them with, an, with electrons, and you get this sort of a two-dimensional projection uh, of these objects. And these are the images that, uh, that we get. It might be... Um, like it could be in a typical data set these days, it could be like a million of these uh, images or a million of these particles. Uh, and what characterizes these experiments is uh, very high levels of noise because uh, you can't keep bombarding these things with electrons for a very long time um, because they just, you know, disintegrate. Um, so you're, you're limited in the amount of energy that you can use. And uh, the other thing that characterizes these uh, th this, uh, these experiments is uh, that you don't know the viewing direction for each image. So um, uh, each one of these molecules is sort of frozen in this in, in, in this ice, you know, however direction it was oriented, and we we don't know for each one of them. Um, so. The technology has been around for for decades, uh, and what happened in recent years is um, the detector technology. There were a lot of advancements in the detector technology, also in the um, also in uh, the the analysis soft uh, software, and this brought us from uh, resolution like these sort of 
blobs that were available in 2013 to uh, essentially atomic resolution uh, a few years ago and, and today. Um, this, this isn't the only method for, for measuring the, um, the, the spatial structure of molecules experimentally, um, but uh, it's, it's very convenient. Uh, it's sort of taking over because um, it, it doesn't require crystallization like uh, extra crystallography, for example. Um, and the other thing is because we're imaging individual molecules, there's at least a chance that we'd be able to figure out heterogeneity in the sample. So we're, what we're measuring isn't some kind of uh, ensemble of uh, molecules, it's really individual molecules. So uh, you could at least hope that we'd be able to kind of separate uh, different uh, conformations of molecules that are mixed together in, in our sample. And that's the, really the topic of today. So especially what we're going to look at is continuous heterogeneity where there's a continuum of, uh, of uh, conformations, if it's there's something flexible or something like that, uh, as opposed to um, a very discrete, um, very discrete states. So um, this, this is actually very common and very important for the biological applications because what we're talking about, these, these molecules, they're, they're sort of machines, right? So they're doing something. And the something that they do usually involves them moving in some sense. Um, so the heterogeneity in, in their molecules is, is, is very important for the application. And I like to use this sort of stand in instead of a molecule like I have this cat and it's turning its head and we're trying to figure out all these different all this continuum of different cats that we're that we have so the traditional solution for heterogeneity uh, for analysis of uh, heterogeneity in cryo em and um, uh, and that's also been used for continuous heterogeneity is sort of uh, to discretize the, the problem, to pretend that what we have are discrete states. So um, in our example of a cat that's turning its head, these might be you know, the discrete states. They don't necessarily need to be aligned. Uh, they don't necessarily need to, uh, there's no, they're sort of independent uh, states. Um, and you know that would be sort of a valid solution for what the, uh, what are the different confirmations that this cat can can take? Oh, and I forgot to say, uh, I since the webinar, you can I, I don't think you can uh, jump in and ask me questions, but if you can ask in the chat, and Will can convey to me if I'm uh, not explaining something or are there are any additional questions. Okay, so so that's the that's the traditional approach, uh, discretizing it. Um, just to put this a little bit more mathematically, these are a few slides that are very packed, so I'll just try to explain the general idea in there. Um, so we have uh, a, a set of models that represent the density uh, or of this uh, or, or the um, the uh, electric density uh, of this uh, of this molecule. Um, each one of these, um, each one of these uh, um, volumes or densities is a function, uh, and usually the way we would describe this function is some kind of a linear combination combination of some basis functions. Um, usually, people use some kind of an interpo an interpo linear interpolation on some grid, and we have some mo forward model that takes this three-dimensional structure, and for each one of the images, it involves taking this, choosing one of these structures, uh, rotating in, rotating it, and maybe shifting it around, um, and projecting it to two, dimension, to two dimensions. There are additional things like uh, some kind of filter that's applied to it uh, that isn't very important for us now. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of noise. So there's, uh, we have a forward model for generating an image. And um, from this, you can construct some kind of a log, some kind of a likelihood uh, um, that sort of describes the problem, sort of a likelihood for each image uh, given the given the uh, the models. 
with these guys, the uh, viewing direction and the choice of a specific molecule of a specific information or model um, as a nuisance variable or uh, th that's sort of specific for each one of the images and some kind of maybe a prior on the different um, on the different uh, on the different volumes and maybe the, these different uh, latent variables. All of this is just to say that in principle, you can write this big uh, using this forward model, you can write this big um, uh, likelihood function and then people uh, try to solve it. Usually the traditional approach is uh, using uh, an expectation maximization algorithm that um, I'm, I'm uh, maybe abusing a few details, but in general, the idea is that it's this iterative uh, algorithm that which uh, starts with some kind of model uh, and then for each image it tries to find the best fit for which model it comes from and what viewing direction it comes from and then it takes these images with these um, uh, with their classification with the different orientation assigned to each one of them and tries to find the best model that that fits them I'm lying about a few details. Uh, there is some kind of marginalization over a few things there, but but this is the general idea of of uh, of how this works, and and it actually works. It's I mean, there's a Nobel Prize for this a few years ago, so it actually works pretty well, um, at least for uh, if if you don't have heterogeneity or if you have very discrete heterogeneity, people got really impressive resolutions. Uh, uh, using these algorithms and their and uh, maybe for 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 us to, to say that it works is it, is it also validated not just you know they got something pretty yes it's sort of validated in the sense that many of these things can be compared to what they do in um, in uh, x-ray crystallography and, and 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 they agree pretty well so it really does work um, and this brings us to continuous heterogeneity, um, and where, where it doesn't work as well. So basically, there are a lot of these scenarios where it does work very well, and then there are a lot of these scenarios where usually the way it's expressed is uh, either we just can't solve anything, or we we get some kind of an object, and there is something sort of uh, that's supposed to be flapping around there and instead what we see is something blurry some kind of an average of different things um okay so i'm going to talk about a few different approaches to this um i'm not going to cover all of them and i'm going to omit a lot of details uh we do have a survey about this if you're really interested in in looking at more of these we, we have a survey that was just accepted um and you're welcome to read it uh so, so i'll try to touch a few of these approaches and especially talk about the things that I find more interesting and more general about them. So kind of lesson learned uh, from these uh, from these different approaches. So the first approach that people thought of is um, looking at manifolds of images. So basically the idea is you, you take all these particle images, images of different particles, and you try to do manifold learning on them. Um, and there's a few different lines of work on this, but uh, basically the original idea, you take the, the original images, you compare them, let's say in L2, compare different images, and you try to build this manifold uh, that embeds them where if two images are, are close to each other in L2, then they would be close on this manifold. There's actually a lot of issues that come up when you do this. Um, one of them, for example, is when you look at this, when you compare two different images, is the metric actually consistent with the metric you would get uh, from SO3, um, which is, before we even talk about heterogeneity, like uh, SO3 is just a different orientation. Is it consistent with SO, the product of SO3 with some kind of confirmation space? There's some filter that I omitted on the way. How do these fit in? So there's a lot of different issues. Um, so over time, people made some uh, some progress in this, and um, they've actually been able to uh, overcome some of the issues. A lot of it uh, revolves around 
instead of trying to solve all, the entire problem, let's just assume that we know that the, the orientations of these uh, images. So, so let's suppose that they're given, that they're given to us, and all we need to figure out is uh, the manifold of different uh, conformations. So we we assume that we have the, the 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 viewing directions. We take images from roughly the same viewing directions, and we build a manifold for them, and then we try to stitch these manifolds for different viewing directions that's that's kind of that that has been the the idea um and again over time people uh people there, there's a few uh points in like you know how this progressed but uh that they they've been able to make a lot of progress on this but i want to show you kind of one of the fundamental issues with uh with with manifold learning in this context and i'll circle back to this it's not it doesn't only apply to this method it applies to other methods as well so what do we usually try to do when we're doing manifold learning our setup is that we have uh, uh, some kind of a scientific problem um, there's some kind of a real physical phenomenon going on there in our case it's these molecular conformations um, there's um, some kind of measurement modality in our case, it's these images taken with cryo EM. Uh, and there's some kind of an analysis that we're going to do. What we want to get at the end is to infer something about the objective truth about this, uh, about this, uh, about the problem. For example, in our case, maybe one reasonable question to phrase is what are the dominant confirmations that we see in the in the data? And the way we do this is we're going to do some kind of a dimensionality reduction algorithm. Uh, maybe one of them better formulated one is, is diffusion maps but people use a lot of different things uh, so so we did this experiment and we did this like with something very very simple we have this horse on a spinning table okay and this horse can look in different different directions the way we generate this we generate this from a uniform distribution of orientation so the uniform distribution of uh, uh, horses looking in different directions our measurements are going to be these the this camera that's look that's looking at the horse from the side okay um so these are examples of these images that we get okay we're going to take these images throw them into diffusion maps um and what we would hope to get is some kind of a circle representing you know that the horse can be in the, these uh these different directions and uh, we would hope that it would also be a uniform distribution because it came out of a our real experiment is uniform distribution. Distribution. So I'm sorry that I'm insulting you. It's a very, very simple experiment, but there's actually, I think, something to learn from, from this. We actually did this. So we did this with action figures. We did this with simulated horses. Um, I did this with Bogdan, a uh, postdoc working with me. And uh, it was kind of a fun side experiment. So, okay, so we have this physical state of the horse. Uh, we take uniform samples sample them uniformly like different 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 horse, horses in different viewing directions and we uh, the way, but the way we measure them is from this camera that's looking at the horse from the side so these are the actual images okay so can you see my cursor okay so so these are the actual actual images so we take them we throw them into diffusion maps we get a beautiful circle right but if you look closely, the density of states here is higher. Um, so if you were to ask me, like, is there a dominant state? I would tell you definitely. It's it's like around here, and maybe also here. Okay, but we but we know it's not true. That's not how we generated the data. The data is uniform. It actually gets gets kind of worse depending on how you look at this. Um, if you do this with another camera looking from another direction, at the time you got this image from a camera looking from a different direction, you got this image. If you take these images from camera number two, you throw them into diffusion maps, you get this beautiful circle. Um, again, with these uh, what looks like higher density regions, but these higher density regions don't correspond to the same physical state. Okay, so we got this these these two manifolds um from two different measurements very very simple setup uh they don't agree with each other and neither of them is true or neither of them re ref both of them are true the algorithm works but neither of them reflects the physical state 
And, and, and it turns out to be a very, like if you think about it, it's, it's actually a very simple, there's actually a very simple reason about this, that the metric for these images doesn't co correspond exactly to the metric that you would kind of think about for the, for the physical state. So there's a very simple reason for this. Um, but the implication is, uh, if we don't specify this, the, the metric better is that from different viewing directions, you would get uh, slightly different manifolds. And it's difficult, it, which makes it very difficult to stitch them together. Um, Sorry, and, you I, know, if, I, yeah. can I ask just a, a few a few small questions? So, sure. uh, what, what, when when you talk about metric, you you just mean how how you compare, say, two of the raw images, right? Yeah. So it turns out that when you comp it, we have a very natural way of comparing these two images in the case of the horse, right? It actually gets a lot worse for cryo -EM, but for the case of the horse very simple metric it just that it turns out that when the horse so what happens is when the horse is looking like away in this direction sort of off to the side it turns out that its velocity like if you're sort of turning it around its velocity with respect to the camera is sort of slow is, is, is kind of low so it doesn't change much i see i see so so we i i can go over like some additional examples but it just it just turns out that this very simple metric, the most natural one, doesn't correspond exactly to the metric for the physical states, OK? okay. Um, it, it's just a measurement modality. Now, of course, this is a very simple experiment. There could be other, like if your measurement modality is a lot more complicated, then of course there's more going on that, that makes it even worse. Right. Okay. Um, so, so the algorithm is doing exactly what it's supposed to. It is the the manifold on these images it just that it doesn't correspond to the same metric that you would kind of want in the physical state in the physical space which means that in practice for example if you look at the molecule from different directions and it's flipping around and doing something from different directions you would get a different metric you would get a different manifold it's difficult to to stitch so that's one of the issues with with, uh, with this there's a lot of other questions about but these methods, they addressed a lot of them, but there's sort of fundamental issues. I'll circle back to this at the end. It's not specific to this, these methods that are like manifold learning methods. It, it's sort of hidden in other methods as well. So I'll-, I'll are, are there any tricks? I mean, with diffusion maps, there are a lot of different normalizations you can do to account for density. So, and, so there are there, there is all this work about, um, uh, so all this work that uses Malanobis distance. So, so yeah. there are special cases where you can define an objective metric and then, or, or something that kind of fixes the metric. It's sort of special cases. Like you, you, there's something else going on that allows you to, uh, to do this. Um, so uh, it, for this technology, there might be something that you can do if you kind of try to go back to the images and look at the original images and try to find where each piece of the mass moves or something like this, it's, but I think it's pretty difficult. It's not a generic solution for, for, for everything. Uh, so that was a few words about um, this manifold of images. Uh, another approach uh, has been uh, this approach is sort of uh, these models that are linear in volumes that are based on principal volumes. Um, so the idea here is that you can write um, this function of uh, this this function describing the volumes, and so, so what this function is is so, so there's the volume, its density at each spatial position, each spatial um, um, coordinate, and there's another confirmation variable here. So for you can sort of plug in confirmation and points, and I will tell you what the density is. So one way of writing it is uh, writing it as some kind of um, uh, um, kind of a mean uh, volume plus um, these uh, principal volumes um, with you know some coefficients to it for each one of them. And these typically these principal volumes are are just the principal volumes uh, that comes out of the covariance matrix of volumes. And uh, there's a problem here because I'm saying these are the, the the principal volumes of the covariance matrix of the volumes, but we don't get the volumes. What we get is images. 
Um, and one of the remarkable results in this area um, is, is that you actually don't need the volumes. It's enough to have the two-dimensional uh, the two-dimensional images, and you can compute the volume directly from them uh, under some pretty mild assumptions. And so, so, so you can actually do this, and it captures this linear variability. The typical interpretation that people use for this uh, is um, they try to visualize each mode separately. So um, they would take like, what is mode number one? Okay, let's take the mean plus tau ranging from say minus one to one multiplied by the first uh, principal volume. Okay. And they would kind of have this movie showing, uh, showing this volume with kind of changing the, the tau from minus one to one, and then they would move on to the next mode and do this do this there, okay? So let's let's look at what this looks like. So, so here's a volume, okay? Or, or very simple, okay, a flat volume, okay? Just two dimensional thing. And there's just something moving around here in a circle. Uh, so if it were interactive, I would ask you to guess, uh, maybe Will, maybe you, you, you would like to volunteer and guess what the, what, what, what the principal volumes here look like. If you did, this 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 sort of typical analysis on this. Um, okay, uh, since I don't have volunteers, so okay, so this is the first one. This is the first uh, principal volume. It doesn't look like there's anything. It doesn't look like a circle. It doesn't look like anything is moving around from here to there. This is the second, and this is the third, and. Basically, what I'm saying is that this, at least the, the classic way of visualizing what the modes are, doesn't really tell you that there is something moving around here in a circle. Uh, and it's actually, you could actually kind of compose different things moving around here um, uh, with these coefficients. So these modes on their own don't really tell you what's going on here. It turns out that it works pretty well for very small variability. But if you want high resolution uh, for high variability, you get something like this that's a little nonsensical. Um, and you know, if you if you write down if you write this down, you can actually basically get this analytically, like what's going on here, uh, the reason for this. So there has been other work uh, that uses these models in, in a slightly more sophisticated way. Uh, I'm not going to go into it, but this is like the kind of fundamental issue in um, describing the volumes in and the confirmation variability in this way and trying to interpret these these separate modes. Um, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about is these nonlinear models. Uh, I call them hypermolecules. Um, and and to get to them, let, let's let's revisit uh, the way we analyze cryo EM traditionally. And we said what we have is these uh, K uh, kind of independent uh, volumes, uh, each one representing a different conformation, maybe discretized from this continuum of conformations. And each one of them is some kind of basis functions with some different coefficients. And when I show it like this, you know, it something about it looks off. It doesn't look right to to, to something and bothers my eye when I plot it like this. But then I could just do this, and I didn't do anything. All I did was uh, was um, a kind of a permutation in the order of these guys. So they're ordered by, you know, how the, 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 what direction the cat is looking at. And, uh, and I aligned them. If you look at the likelihood function, there's absolutely no difference between this and this. They're the same. But the fact that this looks right to us uh, actually ha carries, carries a meaning that you don't see if you try to discretize the problem. Um, so basically what happens is, so the, the, the basic idea that we propose is, is to think about this as a kind of a higher dimensional object. 
And if you think about this as a higher dimensional object, there's sort of this continuum of different conformations. So the way you do this, like the simplest, most naive way of doing it is to say, okay, instead of having the, these um, uh, 3D, um, these 3D basis functions, now we have uh, 4D basis functions. And we're going to make them continuous in this fourth dimensional that we're using for the conformation. And this sort of, and, and since we're going to truncate uh, which basis functions we're using, it sort of forces it to be some kind, some, somehow uh, some kind of a continuum of, of, uh, of different objects and we can interpolate between them. And, and it actually carries additional meaning and, you know, what's a reasonable conformation and what isn't. So, so this continuity uh, actually has um, value in the sense of information um, for solving the problem. Um, and this smoothness sort of forces some kind of self-organization. So- um, so you mean you're talking about smoothness in of the basis functions? Like of, so smoothness of... of the basis functions as you, uh, through this, when you, as you, Kind of go through this these additional dimensions of uh, conformation. So right. it's smooth. So it's smooth in tau. I see. I see. Okay. And then you, it would require knowing, um, like, what tau should be. Should tau, tau be one parameter, two parameters? So, so okay. So so um, the most naive thing to do, yeah. That, then that's how we started. Yeah, you, you just put one. It turns out that it actually is useful to overparameterize it for the solvers and and then kind of find what regions of tau are, are actually populated and which aren't populated. I see. And and we'll see this again in, in some addition in, in additional methods that it, it's it's more pronounced there. Mm -hmm. uh, but it actually turns out that it's good to overparameterize it somehow the the optimizations when you run this they they have better paths uh, like very informally they have better better sort of paths to resolve um um you know local minimum I see. that's what it looks like interesting uh so we did this uh in this type of experiments we did this up to like two or three I'll talk about additional experiments where you can actually go to objects that are like 15 dimensional or something like that. Um, but, 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 but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, but, it is an important point. I mean, when you have uh, 15 dimensions, the, the basis functions. So it, it gets a little, so, so obviously I'm lying when okay. I'm saying, when I'm saying 15 dimensional, I'm not saying anything else. So I'll, I'll have to explain how can I say 15 dimensional and say something about basis function and and like claiming that I actually implemented anything like that. Okay. okay. So I'll, I'll circle back to that. All right. How much time do I have? Uh, you should try to end maybe at uh, 2.20 or so. So okay. five minutes okay. for questions. Okay. Um, okay. So just to kind of summarize this idea, we can write these, uh, there, there are many different ways we could write these high dimensional functions. The classic way for, for an analyst is to say, I have these higher dimensional, uh, I have these higher dimensional functions. The easiest way of doing this for, for an analyst is probably to say, I have some product of three, some three dimensional functions and you can choose whatever ones you want. The right ones are prolates, prolates, prolates for riddle functions. Um, but I, I shouldn't, that's a whole other talk. Uh, multiplied by say uh, polynomials in uh, uh, one dimensional, two dimensional polynomials, for example, uh, for these additional conformation dimensions. So that's an easy way of uh, writing it. And it's sort of an easy way of encoding this uh, continuity. Um, and what we then need to do is we need to solve for these coefficients for these uh, um, for these uh, these coefficients for 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 these basis functions. And there is these nuisance variable for each image that are kind of annoying. Uh, you kind of try to uh, optimize for the orientation and uh, and the confirmation variable. When I say solve 
it's uh, there, there's different ways of, of looking at it. It's you either try to optimize or it's, it's, formally, it's better to say that you try to sample from them or, or do some kind of variational approximation of the distribution of these uh, orientations. Um, but for what we're talking about, these are sort of details, not, not that important. Uh, so there's many different ways of writing, but there's many different ways of writing these functions. And I think, so, so sorry, before this, I'll just show you, that's an example with, with the cat, just because I started with the cat. This is like the original experiments we did with just throwing in these uh, simulated images uh, of cryo-EM from different viewing directions. You don't tell the algorithm which viewing direction it is from. You don't tell it which confirmation. And uh, the algorithm uh, runs some kind of a hack of stochastic gradient descent and, and finds uh, this higher dimensional object uh, that I'm showing here. So I'm kind of going through different tiles and showing you the three the three dimensional objects that it finds for these different tiles. Um, so like I said, this isn't necessarily the, the only way of writing these functions. And, and one of the really surprising, so, so one of the things that came after this was this uh, software called CryoDragon. And they introduced two really cool ideas. Uh, that wasn't my work. Um, so one of them is how to represent these functions. Um, so what is a function? A function takes x, y, z, and this tau, right, and spits out a value. What's the density? Okay. In this case, in, in, in the Fourier domain, so w, x, w, uh, w, omega x, omega z, or omega y, omega z, and, and this confirmation. So, so what they said is, okay, just to implement this function, just use a neural network. It gets this x, y, z, and it spits out a value. And if you want to get an image, just evaluate these, uh, evaluate the image at different uh, different coordinates and put together an image. Um, and 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 it works amazingly well. It actually doesn't work if you just put x, y, z, uh, or uh, Omega X, Omega Y, Omega Z. It works only if you put Omega X and like sine of Omega X, like different harmonics. So you kind of generate these and put them. Uh, so that's called positional encoding. And you put these into the neural network. And that's actually, I think, very interest, a very interesting thing for the analysts among us, or like, sort of like generalizing this concept of analysis, like why these. Um, these representational functions work so well. It, it, it's, I think, kind of remarkable um, result. It doesn't work if you just take this classical neural network and just put x, y, z. It requires you to put these uh, sines and cosines of these, uh, of these functions, uh, which I find is very interesting. So that's one thing they did, how to represent this, what I call hypermolecule uh, with a neural network. The other thing that they did is they said that they built this uh, variational autoencoder uh, architecture. So what it means is we have this annoying thing where we need to follow the confirmation variable and the viewing direction for each for each image. And they said so, so they actually in the original version they need to fix the orientation. So let's ignore the orientation for now. There's this annoying latent variable tau for the confirmation. And what they said is, is instead of trying to optimize this for each individual image, just build another neural network. That's the encoder in this variational autoencoder architecture. This encoder receives an image and magically spits out this tau. So you don't have to track it for each one of the images. You just magically have this neural network that receives an image and spits out the, the appropriate tau. Um, so they kind of train, which is the new word for bit, um, uh, this neural network that takes an image, uh, spits out tau, takes this tau, puts it into a neural network that, um, that produces, uh, that's supposed to produce an image and this decoder is a neural network that represents these hypermolecules, is like any possible confirmation. 
And this uh, encoder is this amazing thing that takes uh, an image and produces the confirmation variable to, for it. Um, and, and this software actually works pretty well. Uh, it trains pretty reasonably fast, um, and it gets good results um, or promising results. One of the things we wanted to see is, so we were kind of like looking at this uh, encoder and there were some surprising aspects that it has. So, so we kind of dug in a little bit to, into it. So one of the things you would expect to see in an encoder that does this is kind of generalization. So it, it would learn to find the confirmation for, uh, for an image that it's, it's never seen, okay? So it's, it's a little difficult to actually test this for cryo if it's in, in, in like real data, how do I know what's the real confirmation for each image? So how will I tell if it, if I give it one image and I give it another image, did it learn, like, did it learn the right confirmation for this image that I haven't seen? But luckily for us, there's a really nice symmetry in cryo that we can use. So um, I'm omitting a few details, but basically, um, because each image is taken from an unknown orientation, the in, it the confirmation variable is is actually invariant to in plane rotations. Because you could see the same image from you know could have the same the same image happen to be like from this direction or from this direction, right? You can rotate it in plane. It's supposed to be, they're equivalent. They're the same. They would be it's valid images for the same confirmations. Uh, for the same for, for the same confirmation, um, and uh, you might see you might see either. Okay, so we did this very simple experiment. We trained this uh, other encoder on on images, and then we um, tested it on each image rotated. Okay, so this is where image zero was uh, was placed in this latent space projected with UMAP. So this is the tau provided for this image. This is the tau provided for the same image rotated. They're supposed to be the same. They're not. Very often it's like it kind of sends the image pretty far away. So it actually has limited uh, uh, generalization power. And what it looks like is that Maybe our naive interpretation of what it's doing is a little off. Uh, it looks like um, what it's doing, what this encoder is doing, isn't really generalizing. It looks like what it's doing is actually sort of memorizing a value for each one of these images. So we wanted to test this and uh, further. And one of the things we did is basically took CryoDragon as is and just replaced this encoder with a table. So now we are memorizing the value for each one of these variables. Okay. Um, so this, these are the results for CryoDragon, the original CryoDragon. This is the slightly modified CryoDragon that just optimizes each one of the variables. It's difficult. So I can't say that they're uh, quantitatively the same, but because even if you run CryoDragon twice, you don't get exactly the same thing, but at least uh, qualitatively, they're, they're very, very similar. Uh, so it looks like it's possibly just memorizing uh, these variables. So this fancy encoder is, is a really fancy table, uh, at least in this case, okay? Um, and I should say, this isn't necessarily criticism of this algorithm because it works and, you know, it might just be a really good way of writing a table. Um, so it's not criticism of the, of the algorithm, it's just like some properties that you wouldn't naively expect that seems to exist there. That So there's things that we, a lot of things we still need to learn about this. Um, okay, so, uh, so so that was uh, the original, these original hypermolecule higher, higher dimensional representation and this uh, variational, uh, variational approach to it. And one of the things that you, when you start digging into this, you, you start asking questions like, you know, what if it's really complicated heterogeneity and you have like kind of a high dimensional object there. You can actually write this, this neural networks that have very high dimensional. They actually usually use like eight dimensional uh, latent space. But if 
the heterogeneity itself is really complicated and really high dimensional. So in this case, like you have several things moving independently. In this case, we have two, these two arms of the pretzel, but it could be four. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, and it's kind of common in, uh, in, in biological systems that there are a few of these things flapping around. Uh, how do you, how do you deal with this? Um, and, and the answer is that you, you, you use structure. So, so sorry, in this case, the more complicated it is, like the more pieces moving around, if you try to count the number of variables and uh, as a consequence, the number of uh, the, the amount of data that you need to um, for fitting this, uh, you kind of get that it, it grows exponentially with the complexity in the sense of the dimensionality. Um, so even in terms of like the, the, the amount of data you need, uh, this doesn't look, this doesn't sound practical. So, so for experiments like these with something a little bit more complicated with the, than the pretzel, we, we did have things that are 15 dimensional and there's no way we have enough data to fit this. I don't care. Like a million images are just not enough for this. Uh, so what, what, what do you do? So what you do is you, you, you need some structure. And in this case, we can look at the anatomy of this pretzel. And this pretzel is, uh, you know, if you know something about your problem, in this case, you know that you have this um, rigid pretzel and you have these two independent um, uh, heterogeneous regions. If you encode this, and again, you count the number of variables that go into the small, uh, you see that it grows, uh, that it just grows linearly. Uh, this number and, uh, and and then it's practical to write a 15 dimensional model for this uh, with actually having a reasonable number of coefficients to fit. Okay, and this idea of structure kind of carries over to uh, other ways of 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, describing structure. So one of the one of the approaches for this. Sorry, this is one of the experiments with this, like an actual experiment with actual data. Here it's still kind of these blobs moving around, but you can see these two things, they're moving independently. Um, and, and people took this, this idea of structure to, to other directions. So uh, for example, one of, the, one of the approaches to structure is to say, okay, I have some kind of a neutral structure and I have my, my space of confirmation is some kind of a space of deformations of this uh, neutral structure. Um, and that's been, uh, so we've been involved in, in one work on this uh, that was just, just recently published uh, that using uses uh, Zernak polynomials to describe these, um, these uh, spaces of deformations. Uh, there's another work um, that uses fancier, uh, neural network to describe these deformations as flows. So that this introduces structure into the system. I know that I have like, I'm, I'm restricting myself to only uh, neutral structure and its deformations, and then I can fit both of them better. Another approach to structure. Wait, sorry, but but that, that so the, the a priori knowledge would be kind of the, the, the relative positions of the moving parts. Let's so, say. so, so in, in in our case, that it was like this this relative position. Here, it's 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 just saying that I have a neutral structure and its deformation. So, what for example, this model doesn't necessarily cover is if I have some kind of a compositional uh, structure where there's a piece of the molecule that or, or the, of the structure that sometimes disappears, sometimes is attached. Uh, so, this model wouldn't cover it. Okay. okay. So, so that's the kind of, of assumption that goes, in, goes into this. Okay. okay. Um, perhaps the prior or the structure to put on, on a molecule is, is that it's a molecule. Uh, so that there's atoms. And for many of these biological molecules, we actually know what is the sequence of, uh, of, of atoms there. Uh, we just don't know how it's folded. And we don't know how it's perturbed. Uh, so, uh, so then, 
this there's this idea for for modeling uh, was to say okay let's represent each atom as um, as a Gaussian and we can uh, that's a pretty good approximation to represent them as as uh, each one of them as a Gaussian and um, then we have some kind of uh, uh, Gaussian mixture model that describes the that describes the volume and each atom we can kind of have uh, we can figure out the function that describes its perturbation for different conformations and for each conformation we can create we, we can kind of infer a volume uh, for it um, so there was an original work in 2021 that wasn't able to go to really atomic resolution they did um, they did kind of blobs that represent pieces of the molecules. Um, then there was another work that uh, did actually go to the atomic level. It's it's in the it's the 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 deep mind group did this. Uh, they were able to go to the atomic level, uh, but they uh, were able to work on in synthetic data, and we we just have this new paper where uh, we're showing uh with, with muon from this original team that worked on this uh that you can actually scale up to basically atomic level uh and work with with uh, at, at that kind of resolution um but this is sort of the prior in a sense right there's these actual atoms there's this actual physics of what's going on uh so that's very recent um okay so there's another very different approach to this um, that um, it, it's sort of it's sort of a remarkable idea. So, so in all of what I've been saying, I've been carrying around this idea that I need these latent variables for orientations and 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 confirmation, and I, I can present it in different ways: sampling, variational inference, this that. I basically need to infer these. Um, but it turns out that even in the 70s, VCOM came up with this idea that um, you can actually infer the moments of uh, this this volume from the or from the original two-dimensional projections. This is horrible images from from the 70s, or, or simulation from the 70s, and um, and and people uh, uh, have developed it since then. Um, and some of the remarkable results, uh, some of them of people in this uh, webinar uh, are, for example, that uh, you don't even need to do particle picking. You don't even need to crop these little images. You can just take the big image that has a lot of molecules in it. You don't even have to identify them. Kind of a remarkable idea for cryo-EM. Uh, and this general idea uh, is uh, can be extended also to, uh, to heterogeneity. So I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about this a lot. And I'm also not going to talk about this thing a lot, but there is sort of a this idea from deep learning for how to do this, not with the moments in a different, kind of a different approach to it uh, that comes from deep learning, but philosophically very similar. And I promise that I'll circle back to the horse. Um, in In all these, like in a lot of these examples that I showed you, you know, there is something like these things that you can interpret as some kind of a manifold uh, of different conformations. And you would think that if you use CryoDragon or some other thing that gives you these things, you can find, say, the dominant state or something like that. But, you know, we got we got these artifacts for the horse. We got them from, like, diffusion maps, which is very structured, very well understood. Um, these guys come from variational autoencoders, and on top of them, you put something like UMAP or something like this. It's very difficult to say what metric is actually actually go goes on in there. So, for now, you know maybe it's something that uh, that a researcher can look at and and figure out. The more we go to things that are more complicated, we might want to think again about you know what's the right sort of automated way of uh, analyzing. Whatever it is that we're getting from these uh, from these uh, from these maps. Uh, okay, so the problem isn't solved yet. This what I'm showing you is sort of kind of the beginning, I think, of 
uh, analysis of uh, conformational heterogeneity. There's a lot of mathematical questions about this, like is it even like identifiability, uniqueness? Uh, how do you validate these things? Uh, many other questions that, uh, since I'm out of time, I won't cover. I'll just mention a couple of things. So first of all, marketing. Uh, there is a conf there is a workshop uh, in June. Uh, more than applied and computational analysis uh, that uh, you really need to you should apply now if you want to come I think it's going to be a lot of fun uh, check it out it's a it's going to be at ISERM uh, if you're interested in cryoelectric microscopy there is a seminar monthly seminar series uh, cryoem.world uh, that, that I uh, put together during the pandemic and it kind of still survives uh, and we try to make it more mathematical. Sometimes it's more mathematical, sometimes it's more on the tools. But if you're interested in, in cryoem, you're invited. Uh, if you're interested in a postdoc position, contact me. And uh, if you're interested in a PhD next year, there's great programs at Yale. Please apply. And uh, with that, uh, I want to thank uh, the funding um, and mention these other things, give you a few other links here for if you want to learn more about this or the cryom seminar or the ISIM workshop. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, yeah, I hope you survived all the different topics I tried to cover today. OK, thank you, Roy. That was a very interesting talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience out there? If, uh, if you have anything, you can type it into the Q&A box or the chat window. If Gilad and Jeff want to ask anything, they can just uh, just ask. Yeah, thank you, Ray. It's a very interesting talk. Um, I just, you know, you, you kind of uh, didn't have a lot of time at the end. I'm kind of curious more about uh, the future plans. You had something in the slide about it. So there's... Um... So there's a few things that we're we're working on. Um, there's a few things related to modeling that we're, that I'm interested in. Um, so there's so so, um, so we're kind of going deeper into models. And one of the things I didn't mention here is that there's this whole uh, computational approach to uh, figuring out structure of molecules that uh, you know with uh, alpha fold uh, things like that. And there's different groups and, 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 and us where I think a lot of people are thinking about how to integrate these models better. And it can be either something like AlphaFold uh, or even molecular dynamics. How do you get better uh, priors on structures? Uh, so that's one thing we want to put into kind of combine these uh, strong priors on, on, on structures with the uh, with, with what we see from cryoelectric microscopy. So that's one thing. The other thing is how to organize the um, these uh, conformational maps better. That's more of a geometry kind of issue. So first of all, we're, we're, there's a few things we're working on now just to show like there's so many ways that these artifacts can actually arise. I, I showed you just one that is sort of because of the metric we use for the um the metric we use for for measurement or the metric we that sort of is implicit from say cryo dragon or, or any other algorithm but there's actually many reasons why uh you can mess up the metric uh in cryoem and we're working on sort of a survey of of these uh these different things sort of with with the goal of, of trying to figure out a, a, a good kind of well-structured way of solving them. But we don't have like an obvious solution for this yet. And just a small technical comment. So, you know, you're using a uh, variation autoencoders. Um, did you try something else like, you know, diffusion uh, type methods to get kind of better results? So, so the original the original work on variational autoencoders um, uh, isn't ours. We are using this in in, in some of the methods. Um, I have seen people use um, like the deep learning diffusion. Uh, I assume that's the one you're talking about 
to mostly to um, to interpret some of the output of say for example crydragon but i haven't used it myself yet for for this yeah, that's what I meant. I meant deep learning diffusion. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just wanted to make sure we're talking about the same diffusion. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you. It's a very interesting talk. Thank you. Okay, well, we're at the end of, uh, of the hour. So um, I think we can thank Roy again. Uh, have our you know, second round of applause if we were in person and uh, conclude the seminar. So thank you, Roy. That was really nice. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, everyone.